Uh, I would like to say welcome for those of you who just tuned in to the IPEC 2021 Ethics in Business, Big Challenge Reinforcing Ethical Business and Integrity Practices. Ladies and gentlemen, corruption risks exist across uh, all business sectors, but some uh, are more prone to the corruptions than others. The extractive industry are among the highest risk areas of business, accounting for one in five uh, cases of transactional bribery according to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD. Natural resources have the potential to generate large revenues and profits, which makes them attractive for businesses. To gain more perspective on the subject, let's join the second session of IBEC with its title, From Gifting to Bribing, Challenges in the Red Line Cost, with our speaker from Asia Pacific Regional General Council, ExxonMobil, Mr. Mark Schnell. And this, se uh, this session will be facilitated by faculty member of PPM School of Management, is also in the third year of PhD student in economic of Southern Illinois University. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Fitri Safira. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Hi, um, Fitri. It's good to join. Yeah, it's good to meeting you guys here today. Hi. Um, uh, can you hear my voice? Yes, I can hear your voice. Okay. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Pak David. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, it is a pleasure for me uh, to be your moderator today. Um, thank you for joining the International Business Ethics Conference, IBEC 2021. Um, ethics in Business, Big Challenge, Reinforcing Ethical Business and Integrity Practices. Uh, my name is Fitri Safira, and I will be your moderator for this session. And before we begin, allow me to explain several things about our session. Um, so this session is one hour long and we will have presentation from our speaker for about 20 minutes and then followed by a Q&A session. So if you have already some questions during the presentation, you can just type in in the Q&A box and I will read your questions afterwards. Um, and in this session, we will be discussing about from gifting to bribing Challenges and the Red Line Crossed, presented by Dr. Mark Snell from Axon Mobile. Yes, um, Dr. Mark Snell has been practicing law since 1986, with time at leading law firms and the Western Australia Royal Commission into commercial activities of government. After leaving private practice, Dr. Snell became a corporate lawyer with Mobile and then Axon Mobile in Australia in 1998. Dr. Snell has occupied a number of affiliate general counsel roles from 2008, encompassing Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and Singapore. And he is currently based in Singapore as ExxonMobil's Asia Pacific Regional General Counsel with oversight of lawyers supporting ExxonMobil's business in the region, including lawyers based in Russia, China, India, Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and Australia. And Dr. Snells also holds a doctoral degree in law from the University of Oxford, where he studied under scholarship and a master's degree in law, LLM, with distinction from the University of Western Australia. So um, without further ado, please welcome everyone, Dr. Snell. Hey, thanks, Vitri. That's very kind of you. And I really appreciate having the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'll do my best to get through this in 20 minutes. I've got a lot of material, so I'll do my very best and hopefully there'll be enough uh, time for, for questions at the end. Um, I'll get through it as quickly as I can, um, but um, by all means, when we get to the end, well, there'll be plenty of opportunity for questions, I hope. Um, I guess I just want to start by getting into the agenda. So if you can move to the next slide, please. 
So what I'm going to try and cover today is just broadly anti-corruption laws generally. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about enforce, uh, enforcement developments and trends. Um, then I'm going to get into a little bit about what we do at ExxonMobil to try and mitigate corruption risk and what we consider are uh, the best ways of mitigating corruption risk. And that's a paradigm that continues to grow effectively, um, particularly as enforcement agencies around the world expect more and more of companies in terms of what they need to do to comply with anti-corruption laws. And then I'm briefly going to touch on um, local challenges. Uh, if we can move forward a slide and one more, thank you. One more. So I don't need to tell this audience, whoop, no, back, yeah. I don't need to tell this audience that, you know, frankly, uh, anti-corruption legislation is a global initiative. It exists everywhere. Basically, every country in the world has a law against bribery of at least of its own government officials. And most other countries have um, uh, laws that relate to the prohibition of bribery of officials of foreign countries. In fact, um, of the 38 signatories to the OECD Anti-Corruption Convention, um, basically every country has a law prohibiting um, bribery of foreign um, officials. Um, what's um, the other prevalent um, factor in relation to anti-corruption laws is this requirement for accounting standards and books and records. And that's particularly important. And I'm going to um, touch on that a little bit more later because that has a very a much lower onus of proof and it's a very significant um, um, arm in the armory of enforcement agencies, um, as you will see when we get into the paper a little bit more. Um, today, I'm gonna really focus really on two um, uh, anti-corruption laws in particular, the anti-corruption um, laws in Indonesia and the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, um, particularly because I'm most familiar with both of those in relation to our business in, in Indonesia. Uh, next, next slide, please. So let's get into a little bit about the, the US uh, FCPA first. Um, basically, it criminalizes the bribery of foreign officials anywhere in the world. Um, and as I mentioned before, one aspect that I want to emphasize of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act is that it has, um, it basically requires companies with stock traded on the US stock exchange to meet certain standards regarding their accounting practices, books and records and internal controls. And of no surprise, of course, like most um, anti-bribery laws, it carries very severe criminal penalties. One thing I want to make point I want to make about the books and records requirements is it's basically exists in two parts. First of all, there's a legal expectation that an entity keeps records which are accurate and fairly reflect transactions. And secondly, that an organization or entity maintains sufficient internal accounting controls to provide reasonable assurances that transactions comply with management authority. Uh, it's best illustrated probably by an example. Um, there was a case uh, against Hitachi in 2015, which focused on Hitachi's sale of a 25% share in a South African subsidiary to a company alleged to be a front for the African National Congress or the ANC. This facilitated the ANC's ability to share in profits derived from any contracts to build power stations in South Africa that Atachi was awarded. In that case, the SEC alleged that Atachi's lax internal control environment enabled the payment of millions of dollars to the front company, which Atachi then characterized as legitimate consulting fees in its books and records. The important thing about that case is really all the SEC needed to found was that the entries in its books and records and its accounting controls and the way in which those entries were recorded were enough to suggest that they weren't doing enough to control the basis on which those payments were made. They didn't have to go as far as proving a bribe itself. They only had to rely on the books and records. And in that case, perhaps not surprisingly, um, Atachi agreed to pay $19 million to settle the SEC charges. So that sort of exemplifies how important this books and records requirement is in terms of a mechanism to control um, corruption. If I could move to the next slide, please. So let's look a little bit at the, the FCPA um, requirements. Basically, they're very extensive. Um, 
it has a very broad jurisdictional reach, which is an interesting um, contrast to the anti-bribery um, laws in Indonesia, which I'll get to in a minute. The FCPA basically applies to US persons anywhere, foreign companies who trade on the US stock exchange, anyone acting in the US in support of a bribe, and the SEC seeks to hold any US parent liable for foreign books and records of foreign affiliates. And that comes back to that books and records requirement that I mentioned before. So in effect, um, Exxon Mobil's affiliates in Indonesia, for example, are governed by that books and records requirement, notwithstanding the fact that those affi affiliates exist in Indonesia and in separate corporate entities. Uh, one thing to note about the FCPA, oh, the other thing about jurisdiction that I wanted to mention is it goes even broader than I've just described because the US Justice Department has indicated that citizens of other countries who have never been to the US, when there has been a demonstrable nexus with the US, they're basically caught by the legislation. And that be can be something as simple as sending emails or telephone calls through the US or even wiring funds through the US. So as you can appreciate, this legislation is incredibly extensive in terms of its jurisdictional reach. One thing to note, and this is another interesting um, contrast with the situation in Indonesia, is the FCPA does, however, allow for payments and gifts of items of value where they relate to the promotion of products or services or the performance of a contract. However, in order for them to be defensible, they need to be reasonable, bona fide, and directly related to either of those two heads. So uh, it's no surprise that I've um, exemplified a couple of events here, for example. Um, in many instances, if you're looking at whether something is reasonable, an invite to the Formula One, for example, may in many circumstances not be considered reasonable, just because of how expensive that event is and how expensive it is to host individuals. You need to look at the sum total of circumstances to determine whether that kind of hosting or entertainment is reasonable. And in many cases, it won't be. So even though there is this provision, um, it does require, um, a, a, at least from a compliance perspective, a lot of sensitivity and training around how you make those judgments when you're looking at these kind of laws. Uh, if we could move to the next slide, please. So let's uh, switch to the Indonesian anti-corruption landscape. And I know a lot of you may already be familiar with, with it. Um, basically, anti-corruption law in Indonesia is governed by two laws, um, the anti-corruption law and the anti-bribery law. Um, more recently, there's also been the anti-money laundering law. And the significance of that, if anything, is that there is now an agency charged with the responsibility of tracking financial transactions. And that agency has cooperated with the KPK in relation to certain prosecutions in Indonesia because of the data it collects. So it's an important addition to the armory. On the right-hand side of this slide, you'll see that I reference what those anti-corruption um, laws cover. Uh, one thing I will come back to lately is the relatively controversial area of losses to state finances, which is separate to bribery. It's something separate, but I do want to mention it because it's a particularly interesting and perhaps unique aspect of corruption law um, that's different to corruption laws in other jurisdictions that Indonesia has. Um, but not without controversy. Um, basically, um, the anti-corruption law is the most recent initiative. It was introduced in 1999. While bribery is captured under the anti-bribery law and the anti-corruption law, basically enforce enforcement agencies in Indonesia generally invoke the anti-corruption law before they invoke the anti-bribery law. Um, those reforms in 1999 came about um, and basically replaced an existing law of 1971, and they were intended to make investigation and prosecution of corruption in Asia much easier. They obviously introduced the KPK, they introduced a separate corruption court. Um, KPK has power to coordinate and supervise corruption investigations. And it even has power to take over investigations initiated by the police or the state attorney. So in Indonesia, the framework for corruption before 1999, the enforcement agencies was basically the state attorney and the police. With the introduction of the 1999 legislation, that was supplemented by a separate um, corruption adequation commission, as you all know. The other thing this law introduced was certain very significant procedural advantages. It introduced the capacity to freeze accounts, 
It introduced the capacity to conduct trials in the absence of the accused. And it even provided a provision where there is a reverse burden of, burden of proof where an entity or individual is not in a position to explain the source of assets over a certain sum. Now, I just want to mention briefly this losses to state finances provision, because as, a, as an investor in Indonesia, we often look at the landscape of laws and certainty in relation to law is always a very significant factor in determining whether one will invest or not. One area where um, there is um, uh, a very significant um, debate going is the losses to state finances, because that particularly governs the activity of procurement more often than not in Indonesia. And um, that's a law that basically um, makes an offence of a personal entity who unlawfully enriches themselves or another in person in a way that could damage the state finances or an economy. Now, the interesting thing about that law is it could damage the state's finances. It doesn't have to. And also unlawful in this context has a very interesting, it, it's not unlawful in the sense that it contravenes a written law. It can also be unlawful according to the elucidation if it contravenes values in a community. And the constitutional court found that this was um, legally uncertain and therefore in its view unconstitutional because the community standards vary across different places in Indonesia and that created a certain level of uncertainty. However, the Supreme Court in subsequent cases found that um, this provision was defensible. And so this provision has actually still exists and is still used quite extensively by the corruption enforcement agencies to this day. But there is un some uncertainty about how far it how far its reach is. And that's probably best demonstrated by um, a case in 2014 involving members of the Election Commission who procured items for an election using several vendors and an average price rather than the cheapest vendor, which was a requirement of the procurement regulations that governed them. There was no benefit to the commissioners involved and all they were concerned to do was ensure that the order would not would be filled in would be filled in time because they were concerned that using one vendor might not mean that they could re, um, meet their objectives in terms of running the election. Notwithstanding that, even given those circumstances, the commissioners in question were convicted. So, as you can see, the um, uncertainty around that provision does um, sometimes produce some interesting results. Uh, next slide, please. Now, um, the Indonesian anti-corruption law, probably one of the biggest changes that came about, and, and I'm not going to go through what's on these slides, you can read them yourselves, but I just want to accentuate a few things about the position in Indonesia, is that prior to the act, enactment of the anti-corruption law in 1999, it wasn't possible to charge a corporation, which, which is interesting. It basically followed the criminal law where the criminal law in Indonesia said that only natural persons can be found guilty of a crime. Now, this was great. It extended the purview of corporate liability. But in effect, from 1990 on, uh, on until about 2016, there are only two cases reported in Indonesia where a corporation had been prosecuted for corruption. And one of the primary reasons for that was that the criminal procedural law in Indonesia hadn't caught up with the law under the um, 1999 anti-corruption law. And that was somewhat fixed by a Supreme Court regulation in 2016, where it, that regulation basically determined that a corporation can be found guilty of a crime, providing certain things are satisfied. And those things are that the corporation receives a benefit from the crime, that the corporation lets the criminal act take place, and that the corporation doesn't do anything to ensure compliance with applicable laws, which is very important because that grounding in the regulation puts the onus back on corporations to establish a process for compliance. Um, and it's that development, in addition to the extent of the jurisdiction of the anti-corruption law, that has really built a foundation for prosecutions of corporations in Indonesia. The other aspect of this law that I want to emphasise is, as I said before, a lot of legislation globally has these books and record requirements. Well, the Indonesian corruption law does not. It doesn't as yet have, 
a regulation requiring certain financial record keeping. And as you could have seen from that case that I used in Atachi, that's a very useful tool for enforcement agencies because they don't have to establish an actual bribe, they can just rely on the records of the company to establish it. And that has been a very useful tool and a number of settlements have been um, secured as a consequence of those books and records requirements. In Indonesia, basically the disclosure of a potential violation of an anti-corruption law is more of a right rather than an obligation. The public may provide information on potential corruption to law enforcement agencies and the government can reward those people either with the provision of a plaque or some kind of um, monetary reward up to 200 million rupees. But it's up to the individual whether they want to surrender that information. There are bookkeeping requirements that exist under the corporate documents law, but there are no sanctions in relation to that. The only other law that really impacts the keeping of records is probably the anti-money laundering law because there are certain reporting requirements for the um, financial providers and other service providers and the concealing or obscuring of criminal proceeds does give rise to criminal liability but the requirement to keep those books of records doesn't exist within the anti-corruption law in Indonesia as yet. The other aspect of the Indonesian anti-corruption law, which is worthwhile emphasizing, is there's no regulation prohibiting bribery of foreign officials. This is strictly a domestic law. It doesn't extend to foreign officials. Um, that is notwithstanding the fact that Indonesia has an, um, is, is a signatory to the United Nations Convention Against Corruption of 2003. It ratified that convention in 2006 and one of the things on Indonesia's shopping list is to enact legislation that captures foreign government officials as well. So that's something that, that has yet to be done. Uh, next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about the, 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 the extent of the law in Indonesia. First of all, it addresses public sector corruption only. It doesn't deal with private sector corruption. And private sector corruption, uh, in this sense, I mean that a giver of a, of a bribe or a promise or a gratification can be a private entity and they can be caught by the legislation, but private entity to private entity or something initiated by a private entity is not captured by the Indonesian, Indonesian law. And again, the United Nations Convention on Corruption has a requirement for signatories to pass laws that capture the private sector as well. And that's something else that um, the Indonesian government would is expected to address under that convention. Um, the KPK has issued a guideline for the prevention of corruption for corporations, which goes some way to address that, but there's no law as yet. Now, public officials under the bribery law are very um, uh, broadly um, defined. Um, and also what constitutes a gratification um, is very um, broadly uh, defined. Um, the, the thing about the Indonesian law is there is no safe harbour provision. Any gratification to a public official basically is a potential bribe under the anti-corruption law. And it becomes an actionable crime if it's given in the connection to a public official's position and it indicates a quid pro quo between the recipient and the giver. Now, implicit in the language of the law is that that really exists. Um, just simply by the fact that you give a gift to that government official. Um, there is a very um, implicit intent embedded in the legislation that suggests that in the main, that's the beginning assumption for any enforcement agency and there is no safe harbour. Um, the, the elucidation of that law extends a gratuity very broadly. So basically a gift is a gift in the broadest possible sense. It can include gifts, money, goods, discounts, commission, interest-free loans, travel tickets, lodging, travel tours, free medicine, um, or other facilities, whether they're received in Indonesia or whether they're received abroad. So as you can see, very extensive coverage indeed. There is, however, one small avenue to avoid prosecution for receiving a gratification, and that is there is a provision under the law where a person can report the gratification to KPK in a timely manner, and KPK can decide whether the recipient can keep the gratification 
or it should be surrendered to the state. In practice, the KPK doesn't have the resources to focus on relatively small gratifications. It's concerned about using its resources to deal with very uh, major gratification. So in practice, even though the KPK has a very conservative view about what is and isn't a gratification in this context, generally in practice, um, uh, there is not uh, much policing of things in the lower end of that spectrum. Um, the KPK has issued a number of guidelines on that and basically uh, expects a lot of the of government agencies to pass got their own guidelines, which frankly they have independently um, done so. Um, next slide. Now I want to just now move to, to enforcement trends. Now we've looked at the FCPA, we've looked at the Indonesian um, context and we've contrasted the two and there's some very um, real differences there. Um, but what goes on in a global context is significant in the corruption space. Um, basically, um, there's been an increased um, and broader cooperation. There've been more legal cooperation treaties. There's greater information exchanges between authorities. There's more coordinated enforcement and settlement efforts around the same facts. And there's a lot more extradition requests going on now as a consequence of um, global enforcement actions. Um, individuals remain um, um, key targets. Um, basically, between the years 2015 to 2019, 144 individuals were charged as compared to 126 corporations. And in 2020, it was the largest ever year for FCPA settlements, with settlements exceeding $6 billion, which is amazing considering it was a year that was impacted by, um, by uh, um, uh, COVID-19. Um, not surprisingly, um, the SEC continues to aggressively pursue violations of the FCPA's internal accounting controls and record keeping provisions that I mentioned, as other jurisdictions have. And one of the biggest trends is that most FCPA enforcement actions involving bribes have been funneled to foreign officials through third parties. So according to the US government, for example, senior Goldman Sachs executives paid or authorized over $1 billion in bribes using a third party intermediary. So intermediaries are becoming a very big focus uh, for enforcement agencies. Uh, next slide, please. Now I mentioned that $6 billion. Um, interestingly enough, that was constituted by really two cases. One was um, a $3.96 billion settlement with the Airbus Group, which it involved a combined prosecution by the US, UK and France. The company directed bribes to officials in China, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, Taiwan, Indonesia and Ghana to win sales of their aircraft. Bribes included trips for officials and occasionally their families to attend all expenses paid events in China, Utah, and Hawaii. One of the SCPA accounts related to Airbus hosting executives from airlines, including state-owned airlines at luxury resorts, such as an event in Hawaii, where the only business was half an hour daily presentation each morning and certain side meetings with individual customers and the rest of the agenda was leisure and entertainment. In relation to the Goldman Sachs settlement of 2.9 billion, that was a combined prosecution with the US, UK, Hong Kong and Singapore. And in that case, in October of, um, of uh, 2020, Goldman Sachs agreed to pay nearly $3 billion in combined prosecution. That's in addition to a $2 billion settlement with the Malaysian government earlier that year. The company paid over $1 billion in bribes to Malaysian and Abu Dhabi officials to obtain lucrative business for Goldman Sachs including its role in underwriting approximately 6.5 billion in three bond deals for one Malaysia development PhD, for which the bank earned uh, hundreds of millions in, in, in fees. Uh, next slide, please. So let's have a look at uh, the recent enforcement actions and investigations. One thing I want to just uh, highlight about this is back in 2019, which was uh, a pretty significant settlement year as well, but not as significant as 2020, it's worth noting that 2.9 billion in fines imposed by US authorities 
uh, for violations of the FCPA, almost 95% of those involved Asia Pacific, primarily China and India, but also Vietnam, Thailand, South Korea and Indonesia. Okay, next slide. So let's have a look at the enforcement actions in, in Indonesia. They have been significant. There's been 300 individuals convicted between 2018 and 2020. Um, the KPK continues to pursue uh, high profile targets. Last year, two former ministers. Um, and the KPK has recovered assets amounting to 66.5 billion, which is no mean feat. Uh, based on the statistics from the KPK, most of those cases are bribery. However, a number of procurement related cases and most of them in relation to that law I mentioned earlier, the state loss law. Um, so far, about six Indonesian companies have been investigated for corruption, particularly since the passage of that Supreme Court regulation. And the KPK continues to cooperate with a number of international foreign enforcement agencies, including the um, Singapore Corrupt Practices Investigation Bureau, it's uh, cooperated with the FBI in relation to electronic ID case. Um, it worked with a serious forward office on an investigation into former executive Garuda. The important thing to note is the enforcement of anti-bribery provisions in Indonesia is not limited to cases where the giver is an Indonesian, Indonesian citizen or entity. There have been a few notable cases. In 2014, there was the corruption court found a member of the Indonesian parliament guilty of receiving bribes from executives of Alstom in exchange for securing a $118 million electricity contract. KPK worked closely with the US, US Department of Justice on that. There's also the INSAPEC case in 2010, where um, INSAPEC pleaded guilty to bribing officials of Perdomina, for example. The bribes were given to secure a contract for Perdomina for the supply of fuel additives. And KPK was involved in a joint investigation with the UK Serious Fraud Office there. And then finally, there was the case in 2016 in relation to the procurement of airplanes and engines for Airbus and Rolls-Royce. And they were initiated um, in, by KPK, cooperating with the Serious Fraud Office and the Singapore Crap practice investigation which led to the um, prosecution and conviction of the uh, of a of a senior uh, member of the um, of Garuda okay moving on next slide the one after thank you so I'm just now going to talk a little bit about how do you have a road in, in the face of all of that what can you do to mitigate corruption risk in your organization basically as I've already indicated it's the law everywhere Corruption goes against core values. The risk of corruption is pervasive. Um, in the event that you're even subject to investigation, whether you're guilty or not, it impacts your reputation. Um, as soon as an investigation is launched, um, it, it sucks up lots of resources and it's incredibly damaging to the reputation of your business. Um, in order to deal with that, you need to have a vested culture of compliance in your organization. You need to have effective training, not meaningless training, but training that gets traction. That training may be um, online training, but likely the not needs to be supplemented by face-to-face -face training, real face-to-face -face training. You need to have internal controls in place and policies that deal with specific risk areas like travel, gifts, entertainment, and for the reason I mentioned before, just because of the increasing concerns about intermediaries, you need to do due diligence on intermediaries before you do business with them. You need to have questionnaires of prospective business partners. If red flags are raised, you need to look into them before you even enter into business with them. Next slide, please. Okay. So this is, this is a reference to ExxonMobil's own standards of business conduct. So we have a number of policies and a number of significant entrenched policies in our organization. And one of them is the standards of business conduct. It's like a Bible for us. It, it basically says that we comply with all government laws, rules and regulations applicable to our business. And even where the law is permissive, the corporation chooses the course of highest integrity. What does that mean? If we are globally going to apply a standard in relation to anti-corruption, we'll comply with the highest common denominator in terms of laws globally in order to ensure that wherever we do business, we do it in exactly the same way 
but when we meet the requirements of all laws, and if anything, go beyond those requirements. And I think that's a reference to the earlier discussion, which I, which I heard the back end of. The other thing about our, um, uh, the, the, the fact that our policy is broader than some laws um, in order to meet that international standard, employees must also acknowledge familiarity with those. And we need to ensure that they are complying with those standards. Again, that traction within our organisation. There needs to be a culture of compliance. Next slide, please. So sitting below our ExxonMobil uh, policy on standards of bis business conduct is it includes a specific anti-corruption policy. And pictured on the right there is our anti-corruption legal compliance guide. And this guide is available online, it's available to everybody, and it supplements the training we provide to people in our organisation on an annual basis. Um, every year we do a training program that training program um, basically touches every part of our organization and that's supplemented by online training courses, a compliance guide like this so that we get that traction. Next slide, please. Um, one thing I will say is that in mitigating, it's not a static uh, field that we play on here. Um, yes, internal controls are a given. Um, the laws require us to maintain accurate books and records, but that's not enough. We need to ensure that we have an ordered mechanism to ensure that those controls remain in place and they're robust. So we have internal audit, we have independent audit, and they look at risk areas like those relating to corruption. In addition, we do due diligence on third party intermediaries. Before we enter into business, we use questionnaires, we do compliance reports on individuals, new entrants or new business partners. Our own contractual provisions with contractors incorporate specific provisions where there's a clear expectation of compliance with anti-corruption requirements. Clear expectation. In addition, to support the culture of compliance within our organisation, we have open door communication policies. The one thing you want to ensure is that people don't feel as though they're going to be negatively impacted if they raise a red flag to their manager or they raise a red flag within an organisation. We need to make sure that people feel comfortable expressing concerns about the way we're doing business. And then finally, perhaps the newest um, expectation relates to data analytics. And if you could move to the next slide, please. As you can see from this excerpt from the Wall, Wall Street Journal, um, data analytics is the new expectation from a lot of enforcement agencies these days. It's not enough that you run a compliance program with training. It's not enough that you create accurate books and records and audit them. It's not enough that you have contractual provisions or you, you, you do due diligence on your third party intermediaries. Nowadays, they expect you to get into the core of your business and look at um, the analytics and use tools like data analytics tools to trawl your organization for potential risk areas. And um, in that regard, uh, we've just rolled out a data analytics tool in within ExxonMobil where um, recipients are expected to input data. And there's a very broad spectrum of um, uh, specifically tailored um, questionnaires that impact certain parts of our business. Because as you can appreciate, parts of our business are very different to other parts of our business. Um, Offshore extraction in Western Africa is different to the sale of Mobile One lubricants in Indonesia, for example. And we need to be able to tailor our analytics program to capture real time any issues or compliance risks and be in a position to address them. And what's more is the regulators these days expect us to be able to prove that we've got these analytical tools because that will be considered a very um, significant mitigant and demonstrate that we're not turning a blind eye to compliance within our organization. Next slide, please. So finally, I just want to talk about local challenges. Um, I, no surprise to anyone here that um, we operate in a number of countries and many of them, there is a, a corruption risk in that country. And um, uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Transparency International and in relation to Indonesia, at least, there are some challenges from a, a, a corruption perspective within Indonesia. Next slide. What are those challenges? Well, for us, where we see them mainly, perhaps not surprising, is um, often uh, we get requests for per, per diems for business travel, um, very often, actually. 
Um, the way we deal with that is one, first of all, we need to ensure that there are um, legitimate requests for support for business travel. Uh, it is actually business travel. It is, it is um, supported by maybe um, fulfilling a contractual requirement that we have or something like that. But what's more is we want to be very transparent about it. So we employ transparency letters. We write those letters to the employing agencies of the officials involved. We identify exactly what it is we're going to pay. We want to ensure that there's no double dipping. We use standard cost standards issued by the Ministry of Finance in, um, in support of that. Um, we also get a lot of requests um, as part of our community programs um, from NGOs, um, because many NGO NGOs have high ranking government officials on their boards. We need to do detailed reviews to avoid any conflict of interest perceptions. And we do before we do or initiate any major community initiative or support of an NGO. And the other area where we see a lot of risk is sponsorship requests, including those from universities, where there are speakers fees for government officials. We need to determine the basis. It's not to say that they're not legitimate, but we need to do our homework before we even agree. We need to look at whether the basis of those fees and to determine whether those fees are reasonable or not. So I'm sorry that I've rushed through that. There was a lot to cover, but I've got to the end of it. Um, I'll draw breath now and see if anybody's got any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Snell. That was a very, very insightful um, presentation. And now we're going to, the, to our next agenda, that is Q&A session. And I can see here in our um, question box, there are already some questions. Oh, no, okay. Um, so if anyone have already some question, you can just type in um, and then I can read your questions. And while we are waiting for that, um, I'm interested I'm interested in um, the corruption map that you just showed us. Um, I can see in the map that um, some developing countries has a lower score than developed countries. So what makes them um, has that statistics. I mean, why developed countries tend to be more um, and tend to be um, better in implementing anti-corruption law and other develop developing countries still struggling with it? Uh, I think it's a combination of a number of things. I mean, you know, if you take Indonesia, for example, it's taken some pretty significant steps in terms of improving its anti-corruption laws. And that's had, um, particularly with the introduction of the KPK, it's had a significant impact, um, which is um, uh, basically supported by the fact that there have been a number of um, uh, very um, significant prosecutions. Of course, these organisations need to be very well resourced. Um, resources in, in um, developing countries is always a significant issue with um, enforcement agencies, but also they need to have very clear rule of law in support of them. And that can be a challenge as well. The interesting thing about Indonesia, for example, is that mm -hmm. um, they created the KPK, gave it um, a lot of authority, but over time, some of that authority has been er eroded a little by, um, um, you know, some jurisdictional arguments between the police and the state attorney's office. Um, there's been some constitutional court decisions. So sometimes these things take a while to get bedded down and, and there needs to be a really clear line of sight. Um, if you take, by contrast, say, the US, which doesn't have the highest score from an anti-corruption perspective, it's nowhere near, for example, Singapore, um, its, its agency, though, is very well resourced. It has significant funds at its hand. It has almost virtual impunity in terms of pursuing um, claims. So, um, and, you know, basically, it's, it's highly resourced. So that, that's one of the challenges for a, a lot of um, um, developing countries. Also, often... You, you would hope that the agencies that are required to enforce the corruption laws are also not corrupt. Um, and so uh, one of the challenges too is to address corruption, it's got to be all pervasive. So if agencies like courts or the police have elements of corruption with them, within them, you need to be able to drive that out before you can even address the question of corruption because the very agencies that are charged with the responsibility of dealing with it, and that's often a challenge in, in, um, in developing in countries as well, dealing with that. Right, and talking about developing countries, we already have um, one question here from uh, Muhammad Fajr. So 
recently we know that um, the KPK revealed that our Ministry of um, Social um, they they corrupt our um, pandemic relief fund. So that's somehow a very sad news to us. So his question is: In this pandemic period, we all know that corruption still occurs in the government, state, and private companies. So is there something wrong with the anti-corruption rules in Indonesia, or is it the system that is not working well? So, um, and he would like to know what do you think, and maybe what can we do to address this issue? Yeah, look, I think that there's been some very definite improvements in the situation in Indonesia. I lived in Jakarta for four and a half years, and I remember when the KPK, it was around the time that KPK was introduced, and I remember it very well. Um, and uh, I, you know, I was pretty impressed um, with the efforts that were made to try and address corruption. I do think, however, that um, there's still a lot of work to be done. And I think most people in Indonesia, including the government, recognise that. Um, the, the fact remains that you, you, you can't, you, you can't, you need to ensure that the agencies charged with that responsibility are well funded, well resourced. Um, and also they've got enough impunity to be able to um, deal with corruption at the highest levels without their prosecution being compromised. And I think the KPK has done a lot of that. They've actually not been afraid of taking on ministers. There have been challenges along the way, and I think that's to be expected. The, the big issue too is ensuring that the courts, and one of the initiatives of the 1999 legislation in Indonesia was the corruption court. And to some extent with the constitutional decisions, some of that um, has fallen back to judges that, that are not independent of the general system. And I think my personal view was that the, the independent court was a good thing. Um, but there's a lot of debate around whether that's true or not and whether that's sustainable. So um, I suspect that um, as time goes on, one would hope that um, this battle um, continues and that things start to improve. And I think um, um, there's also the capacity to be able to extend the reach of the anti-corruption laws in Indonesia. For one, it doesn't deal with foreign um, uh, uh, foreign officials, which I think it should. Uh, I think it needs to be extended to private sector. I think it should. There needs to be more prosecutions of companies and that's starting to happen now that they've, the um, procedural rules have been addressed. So I think there's, it's evolving evolving in, in Indonesia. Um, and perhaps um, the perception index has improved in Indonesia, whereas in some other places, it's actually gone back, so. Yeah, yeah that's certainly some good news there, but um, still um, there are some challenges and we hope to see those improvements next. Um, so the title of this session is actually from gifting to bribing. And we know that there is a thin line between giving and bribing. So we have a question here from our friend, Chitra. So she would like to ask, um, is it effective to put limitation on gift or hospitality, for example, a maximum of $100? And will you work with a third party that refuse your anti-corruption policy? Um, I think the question of effective is, is there's a lot of judgment in any anti-corruption program, particularly if I talk about ExxonMobil, for example, we operate in a lot of places where there are some very significant challenges. Um, and often we rely quite heavily on our books and records. So we might give a gift, for example, of, of uh, we, we might be um, asked to give a gift and uh, there'll be a review process, internal review process, where we set the standards according to the highest legal standard globally. Um, so sometimes what we consider appropriate um, globally um, may be more strict than the requirements locally and we'll enforce those. So we're pretty conservative um, about these things. The other thing we're very minded of is it's okay, one part of a very large organisation dealing with a government official over here and then another part of your organisation dealing with the same government official over here, and ultimately that government official has um, gets a lot of benefits that are not tracked. So our own internal tracking mechanism. So I think a large, a large part of the responsibility falls on the organisations that interact with those government officials. To some extent, you have to supplement um, the legal regime in some places, 
and particularly if you're caught by other legislation that sets higher standards. So one of the challenges we have is making sure that we do that. Um, so your hundred dollars depends on what it means and what circumstances and and a whole host of things. It's a bit like the hosting example I gave. Um, you might be hosting a very senior individual at a Grand Prix event where the cost is quite high. Relative to the nature of that hosting, it may be acceptable if, for example, it's um, you know someone at a particularly high level, um, but it wouldn't be acceptable if you were extending that to someone who had the power to make a decision, for example, about granting you a permit or a license. And um, the, the, the entertainment is, is extremely extravagant. It wouldn't be acceptable. There, there's a lot of judgment in your compliance regime and it's being in a position to sort of address that judgment at the front end before you make any decisions that you regret. Because once you've made those decisions, um, the organization is in all sorts of trouble. Okay, uh, thank you. So um, we still have quite a lot of questions here. So um, next we have questions from our friend here, uh, Budi Hartono. So um, we have discussed about um, the implementation of um, anti-corruption um, law and policy in Exxon, but he wants to know more about how Exxon cope with Indonesian challenge. Um, we've been doing business in Indonesia for over a hundred years. <laughs> um, so um, uh, we know Indonesia very well. Um, frankly, we love Indonesia, <laughs> um, uh, uh, especially really nice batik. Um, but uh, um, I I'll tell you one thing is that um, in Indonesia, it is a challenge. It it's important. Uh, I know when we were involved in the, um, um, in the development of CEPU, for example, we experienced a lot of challenges from an anti-corruption perspective, particularly at the provincial and local government level in relation to land acquisition or other things. And um, what was, we found was important was really anybody who was doing anything for us in relation to that project were really aware of what potential red flags were. Something, even if there was some doubt as to whether it was somehow potentially corrupt, we wanted those issues raised early and we wanted people to be able to ask questions of someone who may know the answer to a difficult question when they were confronted with it real time. So how we dealt with that in Indonesia is how we deal with it everywhere else. We made sure that everybody who was involved in that project was dealing with local government officials, was dealing with land acquisition, um, understood the rules and they got the right training, but also they had someone who they could speak to and they also had access to advisors who were experts in the area. So we, we have a very extensive network of compliance expertise because we operate in places where there's all sorts of compliance risks. There could be sanctions risks like doing business with Russia, for example, or doing business in China, for example, um, which is very complicated right down to um, compliance risks related to things like corruption where there's very specific local expectations that you need to know about and you need to be ready to respond to them in a certain way and be consistent in your resistance to them. What we found in Indonesia is generally most people know that if they ask us for something that's not really they're entitled to, we'll generally say no and they stop asking for it after a while. Um, so in a way, you know, private entities are the front line um, as well as government entities, obviously, in trying to hold that standard. As soon as you slip, people start asking more and the corruption issues become more endemic. Yeah, right. So it's very, very important to know the local culture and um, to create the best approach um, so that we can work hand in hand in a good manner. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Snell. Um, this is actually the end of our session. So before we close our session, I would like to summarize uh, on what we have discussed so far. So we talk about what anti-corruption law mostly covered and uh, we discuss um, the US FCPA and the Indonesian anti-corruption landscape. And then we also talk about some cases in enforcement, development and trends, what happened right now and how some cases are approached. And then we also talk about um, how do we mitigate the corruption risk uh, 
and some local challenges that we face in implementing the anti-corruption. So um, before I close our session today, I would like to invite you once again um, to give us our um, final remark. Well, I just want to really extend um, my warm appreciation to, to PPM for, for inviting me today to provide um, at least our insights in relation to how we deal with corruption and basically the regime within which we operate and also cover some of the things that keep me awake at night um, across the region which I operate. Um, and, you know, if we had more time, I could get into a lot more detail. It does become quite challenging. Um, but I'm, I really do appreciate the opportunity to share my thoughts today. And I just want to thank, thank you greatly for that. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Snell. It was a pleasure for us too to have you joining us here. Um, we have so much insights for our session. And thank you so much to all our participants today. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining our talks. And lastly, um, please be safe, be healthy, and all the best. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, thank you very much, Petri, and also Mr. Mark Schnell for the interesting conversation and also uh, the presentation. And before we conclude this session, we'd like to ask you to have our photo sessions together. Okay, please have your best position. And I'm going to count to three. Are you ready? Here we go. In one, two, three. All right, once again. Okay, one, two, three. Once again, give a round of applause for this session. Give your best virtual round of applause for this session. And uh, best of luck for ExxonMobil all over uh, the world. And also best of luck for Fitri for your uh, PhD st student. Thank you. <laughs>